presentations about. So I have a interest in several companies. Like I said, the one that uh, that that pays for uh, gas in the car and and water in the light bill is, is Unique HR. Uh, another interest, another company I have an interest in is <clears throat> it's a safety performance group. And so what that company uh, was, or is, I should say, it's a company me and my best friend opened, uh, uh, best friend from college. Uh, we opened it probably about, it's been about maybe eight years. And what that business is, we're a third-party safety administration company, so we do third-party safety administration. So Mike talked a little bit earlier about uh, opportunities in oil and gas. So what we did was we identified a growing need, an area, and we said there's an opportunity for us to get into that field. So my background is HR, so I know a little bit about HR and safety and those components. My partner uh, knew nothing of, of, of safety. Uh, he's, he was actually at the time uh, the chief financial officer at a hospital in, San, in near, actually near Austin in Lakeway. And uh, we decided to get into the safety business. Part of what we did is, let's see where we're at here. Is it this one? Yeah. So part of what we did was in safety, what we were doing there is uh, as a third party safety administration company, companies would hire us specifically not the prime contractors, not like Shell or Exxon, but in the Eagle Ford Shell area with what's happening with technology and the new model, now you have on a drill site, you have anywhere from 40 to 60 different types of, of uh, businesses, operators, uh, service companies that are each doing one small piece of a drilling operation. The moving sand, uh, moving pipe, testing, uh, all types of things. The new industry is called hot shots where a company will just hire somebody to quickly move a, one piece of product back and forth or a material, piece of material they need. So there's a bunch of these smaller little operators. When I say small, it's also welding companies. Um, some of these companies were actually clients of mine on the HR side. This is the, this is the guy who had, maybe he was a welder. He had one welding truck. His dad was a welder. And he's been a welder, say, 18 years. And before you know it, he starts growing. I need two trucks and five trucks. And now he's got 30 welding trucks. And he's doing welding and fabrication all over the, uh, the Eagle Ford Shell area. So they grow very, very fast. The challenge is now in, in fracking, you have multiple subcontractors that are responsible, whether they know it or not, they're responsible to show their safety program quickly. And they can't do it because I'm a welder and I'm running from job to job and things are going great and, and moving very fast. I don't have time to, to have a system in place to, to track my safety program when somebody asks for a, an inspection on something. So they hired us, they would, those are, that, that was our, that's our target group. So what they would do is they would outsource uh, safety, the safety administration for their company to a small company like ours. And we would do safety, so we would say, okay, to get on that job site, uh, what Exxon wants to see you have, you must have these 21 uh, training programs. We're going to train your staff in that quickly. Um, when there's an, an accident or an incident, they have to respond very, very quickly, and there's certain things that they have to respond to and, and show proof and investigate. The challenge is is in that industry, say Shell, it, happened, it happens all the time. The Shell uh, contractor would say, we're in Zapata, and they would do a, a, a paper file. They would go out and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to just draw a name and a hat, and I'm going to do an inspection on, on this date. I need to know every single operator and subcontractor that was on these five drill sites in the last 72 hours. And we're going to have a meeting tomorrow and I see a list here, there's 35 operators that must be here tomorrow, and I need them in person here. So what would they do? They'd scramble, and we would go on their behalf, and we would go with at least our, our clients, and we would, we would uh, provide the documentation. What was happening is my CFO friend, as organized as he is, how are you supposed to be able to pull that stuff anywhere, anytime? It's, it's, it's difficult. So 
yeah, we had a little van with, we carried around all of our clients' safety documentation in the van. And I'm saying, and we said, this is stupid. Like, oh, oh we're going to put on an Excel sheet. Uh, yeah, oh, come on, man. This is, it's, it's, and, and we would show up to these meetings and we looked like sophisticated because we had an Excel sheet. But they would call somebody else and everybody, they would lie. Oh, I'll get that to you next week. Well, what, what happened was Exxon would say, they're off the contract. I don't want them on the drill site. They're done. So they've lost a big contract because their processes were poor. So what we did was, I said, there's got to be a better way. And where this started was a service model to fix a problem in their own company. And it grew from there. A uh, little bit about entrepreneurship. Uh, which one are you? I've, I've kind of somewhere in between, somewhere from insanity to reality. Those of you who have a dream, something you're trying, you talk to people, they're thinking you're crazy, what are you doing? You can usually overcome that. But when you pitch your little, your little idea that you put all your heart and soul into to a prospect that you're saying, give me your funds, invest in my company, and they take an idea and they get it and they squash it and they step on it and they, they spit on it. That hurts. So to be in that world, I always tell folks, it's somewhere in between. A little bit of insanity reality. Um, that's, that's me on Friday afternoon sometimes on the guy on the top. So really, it, uh, entrepreneurship is really in the nutshell. You're somewhere in, in between and you're kind of always moving. Sometimes you're a little delusional and you're just dreaming. I, I, I'm seeing uh, Dr. Sargent kind of, I would pitch some of these ideas to him and he, was, he would always be supportive and, and, and after a while uh, I almost got embarrassed because I would take him the next idea, I'm doing what? And I would think, man, I wonder if he thinks I'm crazy. Like, you're doing what now? Why are you doing that? But he was very, he's a great, great mentor. But I was always mainly on the delusional side, but you have to quickly ask yourself, how can I scale this? What's my end game? What am I trying to accomplish? What problem am I trying to solve? And you have to be your own worst enemy and your own best cheerleader at the same time. It's very, very difficult. And I used to always tell, uh, I had a mentor of mine used to always tell me, you have to be able to say the baby is ugly. So you have to be able to say, I know I'm in love with this idea, but it's ugly. This is stupid. What are we doing? And sometimes that person is, the, is you, is one person. That's a lonely place. So you have to be your cheerleader and you have to be a, a realist at the same time. Very, very crazy. So uh, uh, where are you? I'm sure you were felt that way many, many times. So... Uh, here's a little story uh, as I jump into this. So we got into this and we said we need to do a better way. We need to create a new model for safety success. So we came up with uh, it's really an electronic, electronic inspection and safety compliance management system. Very, very fancy. So the scenario, auditor, our biggest customer, or OSHA, arrives on a job site for a surprise inspection. Uh, they've just had a minor to serious accident. We need to, and they say we need to track what happened now. What do you do? Where do you start? Where do you go? So traditional uh, safety management problems. So under these are the typical problems with uh, typical safety management programs. Asset identification. Where's the piece of equipment? Well, it was here and somebody got it. Now it's here. Um, how often should these inspections be scheduled? Uh, they're very time consuming. There's a lot of unmanageable paperwork that we had to, had to work through. Like I mentioned, when we have an audit, we would literally have boxes of files and we felt kind of silly, but you have to be able to prove. I can't, you can't tell somebody you did the training, you have to present the training document. And that was very difficult. We said we have to get this electronically somehow uh, in, a, in an electronic format. Uh, so what we did was in our model, we said we're going we're gonna to audit three things people, places, and things. So when we say per people, the questions we have to be able to answer, are workers properly trained to identify hazards that need, or do they need, what certifications does the person need? Places, when was that area last inspected, the location? Things, these are pieces of equipment, protective gear, heavy equipment, what's the inspection schedule for that piece of equipment? What's the safety procedure for that piece of equipment? That forklift that we bought, 
the where's the maintenance manual? Well, that thing's gone. It's it's full of oil and it's gone. Well, you have to reproduce and say my safety inspection is 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 following the manufacturer's protocol. Well, where's the manual? Don't tell me where it is. I need to see it right now. So our system needed to do that. So the solution in terms of identification, fully electronic. Let me just jump to this. So the steps. We identified the asset, and what we did was, in terms of RFID, you might have seen the title. It's Remote Frequency Identification Tags. So we, uh, we found a company that, we, so we didn't make, let me t make a, a, a statement. I did not invent RFID tags. I didn't even invent the cloud-based system. I had a problem. I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. My first grade math teacher and my mom would verify I'm not a math student or engineer. But I found a problem, so we had to find who, where does this exist? I actually found a small company, a startup company in Canada that was doing some of this that wanted to get into oil and gas industry, didn't know how. They were doing some things for like a safety inspection program similar to this, a cloud-based system for <clears throat> uh, crane operators. So I found them in Canada. I said, we can take this model and make it bigger because we have a client base that needs what you have with a few other additions. So I found them. They were doing barcode scanning. So I said, we need to find a vendor that makes industrial type RFID tags, remote frequency identification tags. Have you seen the little tags like at shirts where they put the, the clips on? That's a, on the shirts. That's an RFID tag. But you, you can't just take that goofy little plastic cheap tag and slap it on a and weld it to a to a crane. It's gonna it's gonna fade away. So we found a company that said, "Can you take that RFID tag and put it in a in a hard shell housing so we can weld it on a machine?" And then that's what we started doing. So I, we ident the process is we identify the equipment. Uh, we we use these little scanners. And we put in the we put in the uh, all the information of that piece of that asset that equipment. How often does oil need to get changed? What's the safety protocol? What's the inspection sheet? So we didn't make this stuff up. All we did was take the manuals, the information from the equipment manuals, and we just loaded them into the system. So we look like champs because wow, when we want to identify what the asset's safety inspection should be, I'm not telling you. I think it is. I'm showing you. Here it is. And if the, and if the inspector questioned, well, that's great. Show me that that you didn't just make that up. Okay. When you click this link, it takes you to a PDF and it brings up the PDF of the actual pieces of equipment manufacturer's uh, uh, manual. So everything is is uh, is uh, auditable in that sense. So. Um, well, the other thing we did it was take human human error out of the equation uh, by putting electronic. The second step is we inspect it. Inspections are done electronically with handhelds. So what we do is once we put the asset, and when I say asset, it is people, places, or things. So we put in if it's equipment. We depend on what the type of equipment is. We'll weld, or we'll have the RFID tag welded to the piece of equipment. If it's a place like a like a this room. There might be 30 inspections that must happen in this room. Well, if this is one room of hundreds of rooms, you're not going to remember that. So you need to put that in our cloud-based system to say, we're going to check the lights, we're going to check the stairs, we're going to check the cords, we're going to check the seats. That seats it'll look. These are the things we're going to check, and it'll give us a checklist. So when I, I need an auditor to come inspect it, it'll, it'll say, it'll push Here's the scheduled audits that need to happen across all the rooms on, in the classrooms on, on UTPA. Here's a schedule of priority. And when you go in there, you're going to take your, your, your iPad, you're going to go into the room, and I'm going to scan the barcode of the room, and it'll tell me, oh, these are the 20 things you must inspect in that room. And I'm yes, no, pass, fail, one, two. You're checking it. And then once I'm doing that, it's on, ele it's on, my, uh, it's on electronic record. That gets stored to the cloud. So now, uh, now instead of now instead of 99, 100 audits, I have 99 to go. At the end of that inspection, I have a list of all the audits that I've done for us for a place, based on a set of protocols that were designed by, in this case, maybe the architect or the bit building maintenance person said this is what you have to audit in the building. So I did that for places, and for people. Uh, 
the training that we would do, they have little badges. We don't, no, we did not embed an RFID tag under the skin. We, no, we, we just say, hey, that's a nice earplug you have. Why don't you replace that with this RFID tag? I say, hey, that's an idea. No, they're little badges. We would just, uh, it has the barcode, and we would just scan the barcode. And so we would do safety inspections on a person. So we would say, okay, this person, uh, we'd go to a job site, and we trained somebody a few months ago, and I see you've gone through fall protection. And you know what? Here's three questions we need to spot check to see if that person remembered what they trained. Well, I already have the list. You should have been here, and everything just was presented to me. Things also, the other thing, I, we didn't do a, much, a lot of that. What we did do was, I, what's more important than that is, I want to make sure that that employee's safety harness is compliant. So that, we do embed an RFID tag. I scan it with this. It feeds into my iPad, and it tells me the safe, that, that employee's safety harness, these are the 10 things that must be checked. This, 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 this. Um, here's a quick view of... That. Oh, I skipped through it. Those are some of the RFID tags. I don't have any with me, but those are some of the industrial ones uh, that we would weld on. I'll skip that. Covered a lot of ground, and I already got the stand up. So, <laughs> what questions do you have, please? So it sounds to me like uh, you you had to write some some software, and some middleware, and. In order to, to get this done, was that already written by the company out of Canada, and then you just kind of partnered up with them, and they their coders did this, or is that, was that done here? Yeah. So we ha we're at a crossroad. Do we find a programmer, and do we hire somebody to do this? We said we don't have the time, so we're gonna. F so we have to find somebody who's already doing something close to this, and partner with them, to and and be open to our feedback to make this this model broader than it, than it currently is now, we did. We found uh, there's a few. The one from Canada jumped on it right away, and they said, we'll, we'll, we'll partner with you. So we put a partnership agreement in place. We split the revenues, um, not equally. Uh, we grew it. The other thing we did was, where this is at now, we had a larger safety company is purchasing the platform for us. So it, it's one of those deals where it's a service within, a certain, within our business. And um, a large safety company is buying the protocol and the system and all of this, and they're buying it from us, and with a caveat that they're going to pay us a percentage every time they, they sell it to another customer. And two, that we have the ability to write a, a research paper on it or, or write up something and, and share it. Uh, because it is about safety. It's a really good program. We don't, and I, we didn't want to just keep it to ourselves. This has a, a re, a, an ability to help keep a lot of people safe. And so we didn't want to just keep it, so we want to share it. And so that was the other caveat, that they can't um, let us not share it. So, we, so the, to answer your question, no, we're, we don't, we're not programmers, but we found those that were. Um, so do you currently still have a license to it? And if you do, have you thought about using it for bridge inspection or any other like civil, like, like, uh, civil engineering projects yeah. that so they have to do a lot of audits, I'm sure? So, like the name and the pro all that's not ours anymore. We just have the ability to use it. So, the applications of this are a lot broader. Like, I have a, a, a cousin of mine. He he's an underwater welder, crazy as he is. So, his mom said you need to talk to Marco because I want to make sure that your equipment that you're using is safe. And I started asking him, well, what do you use? Oh, they just do this check and they just check it here. And I said, you know. Somebody can get killed if that stuff you're using is not safe. So, yeah, they, the, we actually talked to the company that, that my cousin works for, and uh, we're doing safety inspections. So we don't have to design the protocols. I don't know what the protocols for that piece of equipment are. I have the platform in which your protocols will reside on and can be easily shared and checked. So it's really easy. So from that standpoint, you can use it in a lot of different areas. I have another... Uh, business that's using it, it's a county. Uh, I think I shared this in another presentation. The county has this habit of, I won't name the name of the county. They have this habit of, hey, uh, a new group of commissioners come in and, hey, where's the bulldozer? Where's the tractor? It's gone. 
They don't know where it is. Why? Because they have no way to track it. So now it's about asset tracking and knowing where the stuff is. The next evolution, I'm not going to be a part of it because we've already sold it. The next evolution, these are dumb tags, meaning you have to, you have to know the assets there and you have to go find it. A smart tag is one that will transmit. The problem with a smart tag is battery. And so battery source. So I went, we went with dumb tags because it was, once you weld that thing, it's going to be on there forever. A smart tag, depending on the piece of equipment, needs to read to you. That's a whole other, we didn't get into that. Cool. So question. So uh, uh, what is the start point for when did you start first uh, doing this uh, system electronically? Did, when did we start doing it? It's not too long. It's only been about, what, maybe about two and a half years. Uh, we showed it at a couple of OSHA conferences, um, and uh, that got a lot of attention, and we did a few little papers on it here and there, and uh, so it hasn't been that long. So I was wondering, as this process, and given the explosion we saw in employment and activity within Eagle Ford, uh, uh, how big you were able, to, what, what, what size did your company start out at uh, before really the boom and, and what did it uh, top out at? Uh, what it did was we were at um, like safety, op safety folks, we probably had maybe 10, so we're not a big company. What it did allow us to do is grow a lot faster and ha we added more clients without adding staff because we didn't before uh, this system will push things that need to be audited to our to us and to our clients and our clients were more efficient because now they could turn around and get a get a, a email list automatically sent to them to say these are the things that needed to be audited these months this month and so what it did was it's a retention tool and, we, and rather than us doing the inspections we made and, and the system the other cool thing about it is uh, the, comp the clients can log in to see the safety status of all their people, places, and things wherever they are around the world. Uh, so a lot of them are piloting this just really in Texas, but the, now they're able to share this through a secure web portal, and they can share that, and their constituents, whoever they want, can check to see the safety status of any of those people, places, and things anywhere. So just one final follow-up. So you got this system, and then you licensed it basically to a larger safety company, as I understand it? Well, they bought it from us. We, I, I wanted to license it, and they said, no, we just want it. So, so it's not really a license. It's the, the, we have a set fee that if we bring on new clients, there's a set rate that we bring on our clients that's like kind of a grandfathered rate. The li I guess it is a licensing fee. We, we call it something a little different. Uh, they're paying us on a uh, per-user fee for every new user that they're going to be bringing on. It's like a reseller, but they own it. Um, well, now I became the reseller. Yeah. So you're making gigantic amounts of money through licensing this to the... Not gigantic, a little, little bit. We're actually, uh, we're putting the money into the next thing, and we're getting into, uh, I think I even told you about this one, small unmanned aer aerial vehicles, because now we want to get into some inspections uh, to do aer aerial inspections. And that's a whole other thing. I'm actually talking with the science department on some uses that they might be using it for with, with, uh, with, with science. Can you get in contact with Roger? Yeah, Roger. He's Roger Pacina. <laughs> he builds them. He builds, he builds the them. Oh. I like, I'm cheaper than that. I like to find somebody who's already built them. No, no, no. no. Like, that's what he does. He manufactures them. He makes them. I heard there's somebody who's doing that. I saw a hand. Uh, yeah, why don't you, uh, like, for the smart tag, why don't you make a solar panel? So they charge okay. themselves, you know. Well, that's the, I skipped through it, but there was another one where there was a student uh, in, in Kingsville, uh, NM Kingsville, who was, was using solar panel stuff. But the problem with that is, is the, the, they're not as sturdy. The panels break down. In those environments, it's rugged and there's dirt and stuff. And sometimes they, they, they want, they sometimes they use these on offshore platforms. And so a panel, man, it, it doesn't last. So that's another opportunity. If somebody could make stronger, industrial, rugged uh, solar panels that can stand the punishment of some of these environments, that's a whole other opportunity there. Cool. Yes, sir. So I, I know that you started your presentation talking about finding the need and then serving the need. Uh, do you have some advice, you know, through your years of experience of how do you find that need? And then, what, like, how do you evaluate that need to really 
say, okay, this is a worthwhile invest in my time to actually go into it. Evaluating the need is the fun part. So Mike's smiling at me because I don't mind for a lot of years. That's the fun part, and that's the hard part. I'm, I'm, ext I'm an extremely curious person. I'm always looking at, oh, there's a problem here. There's another problem here. That's the fun part. The discipline comes in where you have to stop it. No, 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 not there. And that's so hard to do. I was going to share something I don't think Marco will mind, but about, I don't know, three years ago or four years ago, Marco approached me and he was trying to come up with some ideas for you know business opportunities and he was thinking about a lot of different stuff. And I said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to get in your car or pickup truck and drive north until you hit the Eagle Ford Shell. It's like the Wild West out there. And there's, that was bound, like five to be, years ago, I there's bound to be some needs that aren't being met out there. And I didn't hear much from him since then. I just now figured out. That's because I see him all the time. This is just one little, little I say little thing. But that, you, you always have to stay curious. What I've disciplined myself is, you, whatever you do, you, you dedicate the time, and I give myself a certain amount of time, and let this thing live or die. And if it's going to die, it's going to die, and I move on. But now what I've done is I go into these things with, what's my exit strategy? How am I going to get out of this? Am I going to sell it? Am I going to... Uh, offer it to somebody else? Am I going to partner with this? So I like the residual business. So I like to do something, set it up, who can do it better, and step out and, and let them take it to the next level. Well, no, no, it's, it, it, no, we were, I'm, the investor is not here, so I can say this. We were making a little bit of money. We, we were not killing it now. They didn't ask me all that when we were talking. But they saw the opportunity. And for me, I said, I, I, this is not the business I want to be into. It served our purpose. Our bread and butter was safety administration. This was just something to fix an internal problem that we had. So it, it served its purpose. There was something that was beneficial. We created it. And then if I could make a little residual money on something that was just an idea, fine. You know. Will, will, will I be proven wrong? What if this becomes a really big thing? Somebody else is going to do it better than I could anyway. I'm not an engineer. It solved the problem. It was fun. I'm going to make a little bit of money in the future. I'm, I'm moving on. But they, I never closed the door. In our agreement, uh, there's always an opportunity for me to get back into this business. So I don't like this uh, non-compete clause. I, I don't like those restrictions. I like to do business the right way. So if I'm going to get back into this business, I'm going to tell you I'm going to get back to this, into this business. I'm not going to do it behind your back. So I don't like this non-compete stuff. So in these agreements that I've done, I always leave the door open for them and for me. I think to me that's just good business. I like to work that way. Did I see a hand? Cool. All right. So if there aren't any more questions, let's give Dr. Garson a round of applause. Thanks.